Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Hey, I'm so glad you're with us on Life Support. What we do in this program is we tell stories. We tell stories of redemption. We talk about important issues, and the goal is to bring glory to Jesus and talk about what he's doing in our midst and help give us tools, too, about how we can go about being lights for Jesus uh, in this crazy world that we live in. My guest is David Stark, who's a, an author, former pastor, who's really got some important things to talk about. And David, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here, Paul. Thanks and for where asking. are you right now? Are you in a warm I'm actually place? in St. Joseph, Missouri at this point. St. Joseph, north, Missouri. Yes, yeah, north of Kansas City, about an hour. Gotcha. So... Uh, we're recording this in Minneapolis, so not terribly far away. I bet it's about 120 degrees there today. <laughs> yeah, we're actually, uh, we have been hot, but we're just above all of that heat. Barely. See, the in Minnesota, the, the kind of national pastime here is to complain about the weather at every turn. So it's either too cold, too hot, or, you know, the wrong season or something. I, I think it's the farther north you are right now, the better. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> hey, you've written a couple of books that are, I think, uh, really important. And one of them um, is called Reaching Millennials. And that really uh, catches my attention because, number one, millennials have been much maligned uh, in our culture. Yeah. And number two, millennials are now moving into positions of influence. And um, they're dealing with a very difficult culture, too. Tell me what prompted you to write that book, David. Um, as I consulted with churches nationally for a decade prior to them uh, becoming where they are today, uh, I noticed that for, for the most part, they're not coming. And, and it, it, so it was very different than dealing with the generations before them, where uh, there were a lot of churches that were figuring out ways have the baby boomers there coming back and even Gen X behind them, but it was really um, aware. So I began to do national research about how do we actually tackle that, that generation, specifically and Gen Z behind them. And tell me a little bit about um, that. You, you talked about these different age groups and churches, and pastors are forever trying to figure out how to you know, make their churches multi-generational. You always have a group that wants everyone all to be together from 90 years old to one-year-olds, and then you have those who will never go to a group that's got all those different ages in it, and then you've got this and that. Why are millennials difficult to reach? Most of them actually have a, a negative backpack on their backs. Not about Jesus. But about the church. And those have come from a series of different things. It began with uh, the biggest exodus began with actually the uh, baby boomers in the 60s. And that, that was a break because of classism, racism, sexism, kinds of issues that they didn't see the church on the right side of. So about two thirds of the baby boomers left, about a third of them came back. But consequently, now you have the kids of the baby boomers, which is where the millennials are. And there were a series of reasons why uh, you've got to, to realize that uh, they're not coming aggregately, and there's a reason they're not coming. And, and it's, it's that negative backpack that requires a completely different strategy to think about um, uh, having them attend church. And probably the first and most important piece of that is if you're going to wait for them to come, you're going you're gonna to wait forever. And so you have to have strategies that build bridges out to them. And so that you have time to build trust enough that they would consider being engaged with your church again. So you're a senior pastor and you know how this works. Most people see the church as a building that we come to that uh, is kind of our home base. And I guess in the old, as my, my sons would say, the olden days, 
um, we would have them wandering in out of curiosity. But what you're saying now is, hey, uh, no, not anymore. Not aggregately, no. Uh, you've really got to, uh, in other words, the evangelistic uh, agenda is critical to churches. And they, they have to find ways to build bridges out to these people on common ground. Uh, so that you begin relationally to even have a chance with them. And, and uh, so it, it, uh, there are churches that have already done adjustments to the worship services, et cetera, to where uh, they are getting younger people. But since COVID, that's even slowed down a lot. Um, and so that can be a piece of it, but uh, you've really got to build bridges to them. Yeah, and the problem with that is somebody has to sacrifice something in order to do that. Yep. I love what one pastor said in Minneapolis is that you have to, a couple of things, people have to become unselfish with their church and with their community, meaning that um, we once again got to have burning within our souls the reality that God wants none to perish but all to come to life. And in some form, I've got to believe that it's part of our very DNA that we need to go. You know, Jesus obviously didn't, the great commandment doesn't say stay. I mean, the great commission, it says go. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of decades in, in America, it was pretty okay to stay, just which flavor, Methodist or Lutheran, Baptist or Presbyterian. Not true now. We're going to have to go again. So would it be fair to say that that spark has to be lit in the heart of the pastor in order to spread that DNA in his church? Yes, or at least the pastor has to allow it from some major lay people, one or the other. But somebody has to light the spark Absolutely. and keep it burning. Absolutely. I have a friend of mine who's uh, he's, he's, he's quite a wonderful church planter, and he, you know, he's planted several churches, and he's built a network of churches. And he looked at me one day, and he said, you know, Paul, when I retire, they're going to stop planting. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You've been planting your whole time there. Yeah, but it's in my heart. I'm not sure if anybody even knows why we're doing it. And um, to me, if we're going to reach these different segments of our population, we're going to have to multiply you know, because a lot of our churches are in geographical locations that does it just doesn't lend itself to being able to find these millennials, you know? Yes. And and maybe that's something more churches need to consider. Yes. And I and I think what the way I would say to those churches is generalize it to reaching outsiders. The outsiders might be more seniors. The outsiders uh, might be either Gen Z or the Centennials behind them. Outsiders might be other baby boomers. Uh, the point is, is that you're being strategic about those people. And so whatever the five mile radius usually is of yours, that's your field, all call to the field. And so whatever it is, somebody has to be passionate about them. And sometimes that you're right in the target with millennials, and sometimes it'd be those other generations. Millennials are um, sometimes unfairly categorized. Tell me what what major features, if I can use that word, would come with the millennial generation that we need to be aware of in order to reach them effectively. So the first is that they are digital natives, unlike those of are older, all the generations starting with the millennials down, they never knew a time when digital reality was not in their life, right? So that is a learning curve for most baby boomers. Most baby boomers have been taught by their kids or by younger people about digital, as opposed to it's always been there. So that's going to affect a, a lot of things. The other thing is, is that they've been marketed to since they've been one or two years old, which means their ability to smell 
you know, inauthenticity, hypocrisy uh, is very high. And so you, you cannot bait and switch this generation because they know when that's happening. That's also true, of course, of the generations beyond them. What is a what is a bait what does a bait and switch look like that could get a church in trouble? So a bait and switch is that you tell them they're coming to a picnic and somebody stands up and shares the gospel in the middle of the picnic. Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, that's a great way to get them to run even farther into the hills. Right? Or you tell them that money's going to go to such and so and they find out that half of it went to the church. In other words, that you've, you've got to be authentic. It doesn't mean you can't be bold, but it means that you're, it's got to be authentic. Nothing, nothing happens to them that was un, that they didn't know about in advance. So, for example, if, if, if they're dropping their children off um, for a kid's camp, say, um, you need to be honest with them about what your kid's camp is. And if you are, they're probably going to be okay with that. But be upfront. We're gonna we're gonna talk about Jesus here, and yes, mm -hmm. yep. And there'll be Bible stories and whatever it is. And so uh, they don't uh, they don't feel like uh, we just got Shanghai. The digital generation. Tell me about what churches are doing wrong. Like I, uh, we're all adjusting to this to some extent. And you're right. I mean, you know, my kids were basically born with a with a cell phone in their hand, it, it made it for an awkward birth, but you know, we, we got by. Um, what are churches failing to do to reach this digital generation, do you think? Obviously, the most obvious is, do I have a website? But beyond that is, do I have ways of communicating that might, in other words, the newsletter is almost a completely distant reality. Do I have an e-blast, the ability to get to them by email, or even more, do I have, can I get to them by social media? Um, you know, those things are not secondary. And so you're managing different communication systems because the baby boomers, the phone was by far number one, right? And email became a little bit later, right? Um, but the idea of print stuff was, really go, was on its way out. It was, you're talking about the generations, even you know, the silent generation, the World War generations, it was all about print, right? So we've got to make sure that our communication systems are uh, coherent with the outsiders we're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. um, so because otherwise nobody's seeing it, let alone reading it. David Stark is my guest, and we're talking about a book that he's written uh, called Reaching Millennials. And here's um, the first thing I think of when you say change your communication systems, which I wholeheartedly agree with, um, and you know, trying to move in that direction. But you still have a core in your church that um, doesn't understand why anything needs to change. And I guess that's probably been a generational battle. But it seems to be more of a battle now than it ever has because everything's moving so quickly. Yes. And what I would say is part of the passion you have to build, in my opinion, is we have to become like the Romans to win the Romans and the Greeks to win the Greeks. And we've, we've just gone through the largest communications revolution in the history of the world, and we're still in it. And so it has to be from the leadership, the noise, but be the pastor, has to realize that the, the, the culture has shifted dramatically. And any pastor who's going to thrive has got to stay up with at least the major things that are happening in the culture around us. Or, and, and, you know, and so that's what that verse really represents to me. Do I, do I even know who the Greeks are? Do I even know the outsiders in the five mile radius to me, what they're like, what they're doing, how they communicate, you know, how they learn, you know, how they how they get to know each other. That's an ongoing journey for any set of church leaders. Mm -hmm. And it also defines how you staff your church. Um, you know, the the video person 
is almost your your most important staff member um, because like I don't know if you're like me, but I'm always walking around going like, yeah, we should get a video of that. We gotta get a, we gotta get that on video. We need to get you know, and it's frustrating at times because that costs a lot of money and um, you know, but. I think pastors have to look around and say, like, we cannot have the the same old staffing structures that we used to have and be able to reach this generation. And what's interesting is I, I spent 30 years in Minneapolis ministry. I'm now in a town, a town of, uh, you know, let's call it 75,000. And they still print posters for everything here. Wow. <laughs> So in other words, the other thing I would say is your context will dictate a lot about communicating. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to look very far. You just find out what people are doing and what the major ways of doing stuff that that really would work. Do you think that, um, you know, you always hear about millennials, hey, they're lazy, they're selfish, they only care about themselves. Has Are, are those kinds of um, feelings, unfair statements probably affect the zeal to, to reach them at all? I do. And I think they're unfair. And here's why. And that was really, especially that was true in the 90s, when people were talking about this. Um, it's because the digital world made so many things more efficient if you use them online or you use them, et cetera. And so the laziness was this, is that for the baby boomer generation, life needed to fit into work. In other words, we were trained almost on a workaholic level on average. Yeah. They watched their parents, you know, work there to the bone. And the big thing that shifted is that work needs to fit into life for the millennials. And so they're constantly negotiating such that they still have a life. And that's because they, they're trying to not repeat what their baby boomer parents did, mm -hmm. was work themselves to the bone and not have a life outside. Mm -hmm. And so rather than seeing it as laziness, you know, the scripture says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I like to view it as uh, they're aiming at, and again, this is the positive spin, towards a more balanced life. And that can get um, translated into laziness from our point of view. And in our own journeys, I think uh, we need to balance life with our work. Yeah, maybe we could learn something from them. Um, theologically speaking, um, are, are there some sort of theological hallmarks that are really important to to that uh, group or, or things they struggle with, areas that they you might have to really understand how to reach them with a truth, this kind of truth or that kind of truth? Yeah. Let me give you a couple. One of the really important uh, concepts that I wish every person listening would understand is that the apostles knew, Paul wrote this, about essentials versus non-essentials. And uh, this is, I think, in Romans 10, I think. I'm not sure I've got it quite right, but Romans 13, maybe. But what it, no, 14. What it says is that it's possible in non-essentials, Paul, for you and I to be diametrically opposed and both be in the will of God, mm -hmm. which means we're not to pass judgment on others. And then you're, you know, if you're the opposite of that, don't flaunt your freedom. It says, be convinced in your own mind, but keep it between you and God. Mm -hmm. There is so much on social media or that we're tempted to talk about besides the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. And so they're very sensitive to all statements that Christians make on, on any medium. And they're not really about the essentials, Paul. And so they're ignoring the fact that we're supposed to allow diversity in the non-essentials. And so, and so what happens is they begin to see theologically that, that if you're a Christian, then you must believe this about the non-essential or that about the non-essential. And so 
you're not talking about Jesus, of course. You're talking about all these non-essentials. I can't tell you how many millennials and others just aren't coming to churches because they think Christians have to believe A or B, mm. and it has nothing to do with the core. So that's the first theological idea, is do you understand the difference between the core of the Nicene Creed and the non-essentials? Because uh, you'll drive so many people away if you don't understand that, right? Hmm. And I, I, I think the other, you know, the whole point of the Council of Jerusalem, which is when they got together, it says, we're going to take 600 and some laws, right? And we're going to require four, right? So don't eat food sacrificed to idols. Uh, you know, don't eat meat with blood in it. Um, uh, don't commit adultery and, and don't drink blood directly. And, and the apostle said this, we do not want to make it hard for the outsiders to come to faith. I think it's really important theologically to realize that what God's most concerned about is where they're going to spend eternity first. Not all these laws and commandments that you'd like to get them to follow. And, and, and so until a church has that attitude, is that we're going to allow for essentials and non-essentials. We're not going to talk about the non-essentials. And we, we've got as our heart that the most important thing is that they their name is written in the book of life, that they know God. So we keep the main thing the main thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, theologically, those are critical to the younger generations because you're not going to get two chances in most cases. So it better be about Jesus. Yeah. Right? Well, I have a, about a thousand other questions for you, and uh, we also have another book to talk about, Life Keys, right, along with Reaching Millennials, and so we're going to have you back, but um, it's been really a pleasure to talk with you, and I know that uh, the topic we've just been discussing is um, is something that's difficult for everyone, but how do you get a hold of this material, David? So Bethany House Publishers put out uh, both uh, reaching Millennials and Life Keys. Um, and, but the big thing to do is if you go to Amazon and you go to the eBooks, you can get them both. Okay. So the Reaching Millennials and Life Keys are the two books. Uh, David Stark, the author, and thank you so much for being with us. This is, to me, really fascinating. In a way, it's scary. In a way, it's like, oh, no, we can never, like, this is impossible. But we know it's not. Um, but it certainly is a large task ahead of us, isn't it? Oh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah.